chapter 11. From the law, Napoleon proceeded to Brescia, where he stayed two days. There he received intelligence, at which he was equally surprised and mortified. This was the return to Rochefort of Admiral Missiesi's squadron, which had gone like lightning to Guadeloupe and returned with the same rapidity. He was two or three months earlier than had been calculated upon and brought back to our coast the English fleet, which had been in pursuit of him ever since his departure. Thus was the object of this trip frustrated for the ships, which we had at Toulon, Cadiz, and Rochefort, had been sent out with no other design than to disperse English squadrons over the Indian seas and to keep them aloof from the coast which we purposed invading. General Lagrange, who had accompanied the squadron, had likewise returned. He himself arrived at Brescia, where he was very ill-received. The emperor, however, betrayed not all the vexation which this return occasioned him. From Brescia, he went to review the army assembled in the plain of Monte Chiaro and filed off the infantry by battalions formed in order of battle and the cavalry and regiments likewise in order of battle and night had the, nevertheless set in before it had finished. The emperor pursued his journey and repaired to Verona, which was then the frontier of the kingdom of Italy. The Austrian general, Baron Vincent, afterwards ambassador at Paris, begged permission to pay his respects to him and caused him to be saluted, according to custom, by his artillery. The emperor received him the next day with his whole corps of officers and two days afterwards set out for Mantua and then crossed the Po opposite to Bologna. He entered that city, proceeded thence to Parma, to Placentia, and then to Genoa which he then went to take possession. The doge and senate of that city had come to Milan to beg him to accept them and incorporate them with the French Empire. I have no doubt that this resolution had been somewhat assisted. Such was the state of this unfortunate republic that its inhabitants were almost famishing. The English, closely blockaded by sea. The French duans cooped it up by land. It had no territory and could not with that difficulty procure wherewithal to subsist. Add to this that whatever a quarrel took place in Italy, the first thing was to send it a garrison, which it had not the means of refusing. It had therefore all the inconveniences arising from a union with France without possessing any of the advantages. It determined, therefore, to make application to be incorporated with the empire. To France, this was no great acquisition. The country had a passive quality which far surpassed its active, so that its annexation caused an increase in the expenditure of the imperial treasury. Genoa had long possessed nothing but marble palaces, the relics of its ancient splendor. Hither had come, by the emperor's direction, Monsieur Lebrun, arch-treasurer, whom he appointed governor, and the minister of the finances, who immediately regulated what belonged to his department. The emperor then set out on his return to Paris. Being impatient to get back to the capital at Fontainebleau, he stayed some days before he entered Paris. It was then the end of June. He could no longer repress his impatience at length. He set out with the minister of the marine for Bologna, stealing away according to his custom. He had caused a line of signals along the coast from Bayonne to Calais to be organized in a particular manner. He inspected his army man by man and his flotilla boat by boat. He had placed guards at the avenues to his headquarters who stopped all the couriers coming to the minister of the marine and brought them to him so that he read the dispatches before the minister to whom he sent them after he had run them over. This precaution he took that he might not lose a moment but have the army embarked as soon as he should be assured that the event which he expected had taken place. He thus gained a few hours on the minister of the marine who was fixed at Bologna, while he, as the reader knows, was at his little country house at pont de about a league from Bologna on the road to Paris. All this being finished, he ordered the parks of artillery to be brought up. They were embarked, and afterwards, cavalry, there was nothing left but the infantry, which was kept in the camps ready to take arms at the first sound of the drum. The order for going on board was expected every moment it came not. But on the contrary, what was already on board 
was again landed. The reason for it was this. The squadron which had left too long the preceding winter with that of Spain was to have been joined by that of Missiesi. But the latter had sailed for Europe before the appointed time. The two squadrons consisted together 15 ships. They were to appear off her role without entering that port. Admiral Gordon, who was there with six sail, had orders to join them. These 21 ships were then to proceed together to take Missiesi in the road of Rochefort, rally a squadron and all steer for Brest, where lay 21 vessels, which had orders to push out as soon as the combined squadron should heave in sight. After this junction, they would have formed a force of 60 sail, which might arrive off Bologna in two or three days. On the departure of the squadrons from Rochefort and Brest, a courier was to be dispatched to the Minister of the Marine, and at the same time, notice was given by the coast signals that is from Rochefort to Brest and from Brest to Polonia. On the arrival of this courier, or on the coast signal, the rest of the army was to be embarked. The flotilla collected at the top of Bologna, Vimaru, and Ambaltusa was to begin the move, and it was calculated that it would be in the roads and three sides. This operation was to have been commenced as soon as the fleet of men of war should have been discerned. We had before us only two or three English frigates who could tell what might have happened had the emperor's orders been executed. How was the combination so far-fetched and so calculated, rendered abortive by these circumstances? The intelligence, however, was of too serious a nature for the emperor to neglect it, and he was engaged in two important concerns to give them up lightly. He dispatched his aide de camps from Bologna itself to meet the Austrian army. So difficult was it for him to believe the report of such incredible aggression. General Bertrand was sent on a similar mission in another direction. I pushed on to the inn, and agreeably to my instructions, I reconnoitered a different road for returning from Donouvert to Ludwigsburg and the banks of the Rhine. From the ordinary high road of Württemberg, but before his aides de camp had got back, the emperor received information not to be doubted of the departure of Max's army from Vels and of the entry of the Austrian territory by the Russians. From this iniquitous aggression date, the calamities of France, he hesitated no longer what course to pursue. In fact, he had already lost some time from distrust of the veracity of the intelligence received. He caused, therefore, everything to be landed and the army to be reorganized for long marches. It accordingly set out by all the shortest routes for the banks of the Rhine where it arrived at the same time that the Austrian army reached the Danube. The Elector of Bavaria, with his family and his army, had retired to Würzburg. The Emperor, before he left Bologna, had in haste sent orders to the bank of the Rhine to collect draft horses and to provide as large a quantity as possible material for the artillery. They were taken quite unawares, and it required all that activity of the Emperor to supply that army on a spur of the occasion with what it needed for the campaign into which it was so suddenly forced. General Marmont, who was in Holland, had to traverse such countries only, the sovereigns of which have no right to say to a stronger enemy, why do you pass through my territory? But Bernadotte, who was in Hanover, had part of the Prussian territory to cross. And at the same time that the emperor sent him orders to march, he dispatched the Grand Marshal de Rock to Berlin. We were on good terms with Prussia, and in friendly intercourse with its court, and scarcely two months had elapsed since honorary distinctions had been exchanged between the two countries. Thus attacked, without declaration of war, the emperor communicated to the king of Prussia the critical situation in which he was placed by this unexpected aggression. He assured him that he was extremely sorry to be obliged to march his troops over certain portions of the Prussian territory without any previous negotiation on the subject. He sent his grand marshal to give him notice of it and to express his anxious wish that this step might be considered as the result of absolute necessity alone. Marshal de Rock was received not quite so well as he had been in former missions on which he had been sent to the court of Berlin. The king said little to him concerning the march of Bernadotte. 
He seemed to be convinced of the validity of the emperor's motives and expressed great regret at seeing him forced into a war which, however, he had no doubt would terminate to his advantage. Baron Hardenberg was less moderate. On the 14th of October, he presented a very warm note to the Grand Marshal. His master, he said, knew not whether he ought to be more astonished at the violence committed by the French army or at the motives employed to justify it. Prussia, though she had declared herself neuter, had fulfilled all the obligations which she had contracted. Nay, perhaps she had made sacrifices to France, which her duty condemned. And yet, how had the honor and the perseverance which she had shown in her relations with friendship with France been repaid? The wars of 1796 and 1800 were adduced when the Margraviates had been open to the belligerent parties, but exception is no rule. And besides, at the periods referred to, everything had been regulated and stipulated by special conventions. They were left in the dark as to our intentions, but intentions sprang from the very nature of things. The protestations of the royal authorities made them known. Matters of this importance required a positive declaration, but what need has he of a declaration who relies on the inviolability of a generally acknowledged system? Is it for him to act when he who meditates the overthrow of what he has sanctioned abstains from doing so? Unknown facts recited, wrongs of which they had never been guilty, were attributed to the Austrians. What result were such means likely to produce unless to show in a still stronger light the difference there was between the conduct of the cabinets of Paris and Vienna? The king, however, would not dwell on the consequences with which they were pregnant. He should merely believe that the emperor of the French had sufficient motives for annulling the engagements which bound them and consider himself thenceforward as released from every kind of obligation thus reestablished in a position which imposed upon him no other duties than those enjoined by his safety and justice. The king of Prussia would adhere to the principles which he had never ceased to profess and would neglect nothing to procure for Europe by his mediation that peace which he desired for his subjects. But he declared at the same time, obstructed everywhere in his generous intentions, unfettered by engagements, without guarantee for the future, he would provide for the security of his dominions and set his army in motion. This declaration was not supported by any direct measure. The Grand Marshal continued his stay in Berlin, where he remained nearly a month during which he witnessed the arrival of the Emperor of Russia who repaired to that capital upon pretext of going before he took the field to visit his sister, the hereditary princess of Saxe Weimar. Nobody could mistake the secret motive of this journey. A person who would not quit an army on the eve of important operations for the purpose of paying a visit more than a hundred leagues distant from the country where it is to act. It was evident that he sought to draw Prussia into the coalition. I cannot tell what was done and said on this occasion, but so much is certain that while Marshal Duroc was still in Berlin, the Russian army under the command of General Buxhofden crossed the Vistula at Warsaw and marched through Polish Prussia upon Breslau, whence it was to proceed to Bohemia. Emperor Napoleon had already calculated and foreseen everything. The maps of England had disappeared. Those in Germany alone were admitted into his cabinet. He made us follow the march of the troops and one day addressed to us these remarkable words. If the enemy comes to meet me, I will destroy him before he has repassed the Danube. If he waits for me, I will take him between Augsburg and Ulm. He issued the last orders to the Navy and to the Army and set out for Paris. As soon as he had arrived there, he repaired to the Senate and explained the motives which had obliged him all at once to chase the direction of our forces and started next day for Strasbourg. He reached that city while the army was passing the Rhine at Kiel, Lauterberg, Spire, and Mannheim. He inspected the establishments of the fortress and pointed out the means of turning to a useful purpose, great number of little resources, the application of which he regulated. He passed the Rhine himself after giving orders for the reconstruction of the fort at Kiel. And seeing the works begun, he had sent proposals to the Prince of Baden and to the Landgrave of Darmstadt to ally himself with them. The two princes delayed answering. 
The latter thought to elude the question by disbanding his troops and by making an official communication of the circumstance to the emperor as the proof of his neutrality. But after the Battle of Austerlitz was won, he was in a great hurry to send protestations of his attachment. The officer who had fulfilled the first mission was charged with the second. Two very different parts to act at so short an interval. The court of Baden acted more frankly. Its troops had joined hours before the battle. While the emperor was occupied with these matters, the different court of his army approached the foot of the mountain situated on the right bank of the river and entered the country of Württemberg. He had sent one of his aides de camp to the sovereign of that country to apprise him that he was obliged to pass through his dominions, that he was sorry for it, but hoped the passage would take place without disorder. The Duke of Württemberg, shocked at seeing our troops to Bausch, had collected his little army near Ludwigsburg, his summer residence, and was preparing to make resistance when the aide de camp of the emperor appeared. His mark of respect pacified him. He nevertheless insisted that no troops should pass through his residence. The emperor arrived a few moments afterwards. The court of Württemberg gave him a magnificent reception. He slept two nights at the palace of Ludwigsburg. It was during his stay there that hostilities commenced on the road from Stuttgart to Ulm, which the Corps of Marshal Ney had taken. The Austrians, commanded by the Archduke Ferdinand under the direction of Field Marshal Mack, had their headquarters. In the latter of those places, the Emperor maneuvered on his left and remained at Ludwigsburg, making Marshal Ney debauch by the high Stuttgart road. The enemy, fully believing that our whole army was following him, maneuvered accordingly. Emperor, satisfied with having deceived him, moved with the rapidity of lightning to Nordlingen, where at the same time arrived the corps of Marshal Davu, who had come from Mannheim by the valley of the Necker to Bettingen. That of Marshal Sewell, who had come from Speer to Heilbronn. And lastly, that of Marshal Land, who, leaving Ludwigsburg on his left, had reached Donauwehr, at the very moment when the Austrian battalion appeared on the right bank of Danube to destroy the bridge, these troops were driven back to a distance, and the whole of the cavalry and afterwards the infantry were made to cross the river. Chapter 8. The emperor caused the country to be scoured as far as the Lech and placed himself in communication with General Marmont, who debauched by Neuburg, where he had passed the Danube and was marching upon Friedberg. He also placed himself in communication with the Bavarian army, which was leaving Ingolstadt with the intention of advancing. The cavalry fell in with an Austrian corps at Wurtingen, defeated it, and drove back what had escaped it upon Ulm. The emperor moved his headquarters to Zunerhausen between Augsburg and Gunzburg. He ordered Augsburg to be occupied, sent the corps of Marshal Sewell upon the only line of operation left to the enemy by Memmingen, a small town into which he had thrown 6,000 men, who Marshal Sewell blockaded in it, desiring also to place himself in communication with the corps of Marshal Ney, who had remained on the left bank of the Danube. He sent orders to him to force the passage of the river at Kuntzberg. He then went and fixed his headquarters at Augsburg to observe what course the Austrian army was about to pursue and to organize the means of administration and hospitals in that city, which he had been obliged to make the center of his operations. He was there joined by Marmot's corps and received intelligence of the march of Bernadotte. In this manner, he found himself in the midst of all his corps d'armée from Augsburg. He moved his headquarters to Zunderhausen and caused Ulm to be hemmed in on all sides. Now one of us could conceive why the Austrian army had not come to the resolution of leaving it or offering us battle. It did neither and waited till it was impossible for it to avoid us. It may easily be imagined how many opportunities of extricating itself from the dilemma it might have seized in the immense movement which we had been forced to make in order to turn it so completely as we did. The corps which formed the circle in the rear of it had traversed from Dunovert to 180 degrees of the last circumference to arrive at its position. These arrangements being made, the emperor approached Ulm by Gunsberg. His army had arrived by the right bank of the Danube within sight of Ulm. 
When he learned that a very strong detachment had escaped from the place and was proceeding along left bank by forced march towards Bohemia, at the same time he received intelligence that one of the divisions of the Corps of Marshal Ney, under the command of General Dupont, which was closing Ulm in by the left bank, had been forced in the position which it occupied and had not been strong enough to oppose the sortie of a very large Austrian corps which had taken the road to Norligan, he conjectured for a moment that the enemy's whole army was about to take that direction and immediately maneuvered in such a manner as to harass the Austrian corps with his cavalry. The latter crossed the Danube and marched with such celerity that every day it overtook and dispersed some fragments of that corps which was commanded by the Archduke Ferdinand. Worn out by an incessant pursuit, the enemy sought to escape us by stratagem. It made overtures and effected a wish to treat, but it was perceived that its only object was to gain time. It was charged and driven fighting into the mountains of Bohemia. At the same time that the Emperor sent his cavalry in pursuit of the Archduke Ferdinand, he caused Ulm to be more closely invested. He ordered the passage from the right to the left bank to be forced at Elschingen. It so happened that the very same day a second column left the place and took the direction of the village. The bridge, though very bad, was not destroyed. The part of Marshal Ney's corps, which was on the right, went to meet it and overthrew and drove it back into Ulm. It was this part which a few days before had forced the passage of the Danube in order to cross from the left bank to Gunsberg on the right. That division out of the six which had been sent in pursuit of the Archduke Ferdinand, continued to descend the left bank of the Danube. The Corps of Marshal Land was ordered to support Marshal Ney and also cross the bridge. The same evening, the two corps slept on the crest of the heights which overtook Ulm on the left bank whilst Marmont approached it on the right. The Emperor, on his part, took post at Elschingen and then Bohemia was ours. Next day, we drove back into the place all the troops that the enemy's army had outside it. His very posts were driven in. He remained in this situation four days without making any proposal. During this interval, Marshal Sewell took Memmingen with its garrison of 6,000 men. This intelligence reached the emperor in a wretched bivouac, which was so wet that it was necessary to seek a plank for him to keep his feet out of the water. He had just received this capitulation when Prince Maurice Lichtenstein, whom Marshal Mack had sent with a flag of truce, was announced. He was led forward on horseback with his eyes covered. When he had arrived, he was presented to the emperor. The look which escaped him proved that he did not imagine he was there. He admitted that Marshal Mack had no notion of his presence. He came to treat for the evacuation of Ulm. The army which occupied it demanded permission to return to Austria to be impartial without at the same time ceasing to be a patriot? I must confess that. During the course of the war, the enemy's generals have always thought to outwit ours, wherever the emperor happened not to be. The emperor could not forbear smiling and said, what reason have I to comply with this demand? In a week, you will be in my power without condition. You expect the Russian army, which is scarcely in Bohemian. Yet, besides... If I let you go, a guarantee have I that your troops will not be made to serve when once they are united with the Russians. I have not forgotten, Marengo. I suffered Mr. de Milas to go, and Moreau had to fight his troops at the end of two months in spite of the most solemn promises to treat for peace. Besides, there are no laws of war to appeal to after such conduct as that of your government towards me. Most assuredly, I have not sought you. And then again, I cannot rely on any of the engagements into which your general might enter with me because it will depend on himself alone to keep his word. It would be a different thing if you had one of your princes in Ulm and he were to bind himself. I would take his word because he would be responsible for it and would not allow it to be dishonored. But I believe the Archduke is gone. Prince Maurice replied in the best manner he could and protested that without the conditions which he demanded, the army would not leave the place. I shall not grant them, rejoined the emperor. There is the capitulation of your general who commanded at Mamigan. Carry it to Marshal Mack, and whatever may be your resolutions at Ulm, I will never grant him any other terms. Besides, I am in no hurry. The longer he delays, 
the worse he will render his own situation and that of you all. For the rest, I shall have the course which took me again here tomorrow. We shall then see. Prince Lichtenstein was conducted back to Ulm. The same evening, Marshal Mack wrote a very respectful letter to the emperor in which he intimated that the consolation which was left him in his misfortune was that of being obliged to treat with him, assuring him that no other person should ever have made him accept such mortifying conditions. But since fortune would have it so, he awaited his orders. Next morning, the emperor sent Bertier to Ulm with instructions and still remain himself at his wretched bivouac. And he might be at hand to answer objections should any be started. Bertier returned in the evening with the capitulation by which the whole army surrendered itself. It was to march out. The honors of war file off before the French army laid down its arm and set out for France. The generals and officers alone had permission to return home on condition of not serving till a complete exchange. For the eight days we had passed before Ulm, it had rained incessantly. At all once the rain ceased, and the Austrian army filed off in the finest weather imaginable. The emperor went to pass the two days without as stipulated between the signature of the capitulation and its execution at the Abbey of Elshingen, where Marshal Mack paid him a visit. He kept him a long time and made him talk a great deal. It was in this interview that he learned all the circumstances which had preceded the resolution of the Austrian cabinet to make war upon him. He was made acquainted with all the springs which the Russians had set to work to decide it. And lastly, with the plans of the coalition. Their object was nothing less than to wrest from France all the conquests of the revolution and to arrive at that result. They were resolved to employ any means, war, division, internal intrigues, and in short, so confident were they of success that they had not hesitated to allot Lyon to the king of Sardinia. Such disclosures would have appeared the follies of a morbid brain or the ravings of a maniac had they not issued from the lips of a field marshal whose situation had initiated him in the greater part of the measures of his government. The emperor could not divert his thoughts from the subject. He needed this confidence to soothe his mind and to account for a multitude of petty intrigues, which he remarked without getting this, guessing their aim. He could not conceive how it happened that though he had ministers everywhere, he should have known nothing of all this. He then comprehended the attempts against his life, the projects of Drake, and other matters of that kind. But he could not conceive how a monarch could be so destitute of understanding as to lend himself to such extravagancies. Such, nevertheless, was the fact. The emperor was affected by it, as he sometimes testified to us. But these plans seemed so insane that he concerned himself but little about them. They were nevertheless but postponed by our victories. The coalesced powers realized them in a great measure as soon as success furnished them with the means. The emperor treated General Mack extremely well and strove to make him forget his misfortune. He ordered General Matut Duma to accompany him back to Ulm, having directed that general to arrange the enemy's columns, which were to march out on the following day. The day of that painful ceremony for the Austrian army arrived. Our army was drawn up in order of battle on the heights, the troops being admirably clean, and their dress and appointments in the best state that their situation permitted. The drums beat. The bands played. The gates of Ulm opened. The Austrian army advanced in silence, filed off slowly, and went corps by corps to lay down its arms on a spot which had been prepared to receive them. This day, so mortifying to the Austrians, put into our power 36,000 men. 6,000 had been taken in Memmingen and about 2,000 at the Battle of Verdingen. If to this be added what fell into our hands in the Battle of Elishingen and in the pursuit of the Archduke, we shall find that there is no exaggeration in estimating the total loss of the Austrian army at 50,000 men, 70 pieces of cannon, about 3,500 horses, which served to mount a division of dragoons which had come from Bologna on foot. The ceremony occupied the whole day. The emperor was posted on a little hill in front of the center of his army, 
A great fire had been lighted, and by this fire he received Austrian generals to the number 17, among who were Marshal Mack, Commander-in-Chief Klenau, Jule, Yalichik, Marie Slichtenstein, Godsheim, and Frenel. The two latter were French officers and had emigrated with the regiment of the Hussars of Saxony. I do not recollect the names of the others. They were all very dumb. It was the emperor who kept up the conversation. He said to them, among other things, it is a pity that such brave men as you, whose names are honorably mentioned wherever you have fought, should be the victims of the follies of a cabinet which dreams of nothing but insane schemes and is not ashamed to compromise the dignity of the state and nation by trafficking with the services of those who are destined to defend it. It is of itself an iniquitous proceeding to come without any declaration of war to seize me by the throat. But it is being criminal towards one's own subjects to bring upon them a foreign invasion. It is betraying Europe to mix up Asiatic hordes in our quarrels. Instead of attacking me without motive, the Outlet Council should have allied itself with me to repel the Russian army. What a monstrous thing for history. Is this alliance of your cabinet? It cannot be the work of statesmen of your nation. It is, in short, the alliance of the dogs and the shepherds with the wolves against the sheep. Supposing France had succumbed in this struggle, you would very soon have perceived the fault which you had committed. This conversation was not lost upon all. None of them, however, made any reply. A circumstance occurred there in the presence of the Austrian generals which exceedingly displeased the emperor. A general officer who peeks himself on his wit repeated a loud expression which he put into the mouth of one of the soldiers of his court d'arme. He was passing before their ranks and he said, and had addressed them in these words. Well, soldiers, here's pr plenty of prisoners. Very true, General, replied one of them. We never saw so many together before. The emperor, whose ears caught up everything, heard this story. He was highly displeased and sent one of his aides to camp to tell that general officer to retire, saying to us in a low tone, he must have little respect for himself who insults men so unfortunate. 